Can you guys know what? The next half hour, we're going to talk a little bit about general anomalies of the brain. Unfortunately, this is one of those uh, topics that there's about 2,000 different different things and sorting out which one is which uh, can be very difficult. Um, what I'm going to try and do is to split them into at least a framework to remember some of them and to try and sort out um, kind of in general terms how you think about these kinds of lesions. Uh, and the easiest way to do that is to think about the disorders of how organs are formed or organogenesis are basically malformation of the uh, disorders of histogenesis, which are also called the phagomatoses. Um, and in each general category, there, there are kind of a, a tree of things to think of in general terms. Um, in the disorders of organogenesis, neurotrophic closure is one of the main features where problems arise. Um, the second one is neuronal migration and sulcation disorders. Uh, finally, the third area is diverticulation and cleavage disorders. And then just to assemble some of the posterior fossa, cystic disorders uh, is kind of, in general terms, an, an approach to, uh, to looking at lesions in the posterior fossa. If we look at the disorders of neural tube closure, uh, certainly the worst case scenario is anencephaly, which is a uniformly fatal type of disorder. But basically, uh, holes in the skull or cephalocele's, um, Chiari malformations don't really truly fit in neural tube closure disorders, uh, but we'll kind of jam them into that category. Uh, but midline closure uh, problems with the corpus callosum uh, do kind of fit in neural tube closure. And then finally, injuries to the neural tube uh, including my grand encephaly and then the milder form of core encephaly. Uh, here's an example of anencephaly. Uh, and notice this is by uh, in utero ultrasound. Very characteristic appearance uh, in the kind of sagittal plane where you see the orbits, but you don't, you're missing the rest of the calvarium. And on the axial, uh, kind of a axial plane relative to the fetus, Again, you just really don't see any neural elements. Now, there's a couple different variations of this where some of the brain stem is intact um, in, in some, some situations, but uh, basically it's absence of the brain, a uniformly fetal uh, problem. Notice the uh, polyhydramnius associated. Uh, now, a lot of these, some of these pictures of uh, the past specimens are from a courtesy of uh, Ann Osborne. Uh, here's a, an example of a fairly typical cephalocele, a big defect, uh, high cervical, low occipital lesion, uh, seen in about 70% of patients with cephalocele's in the, in the uh, northern hemisphere here. Uh, the less common one is basically a defect in the frontoethmoidal sinus, uh, frontoethmoidal uh, region of the brain. Uh, often these are kind of reddish areas that get uh, get redder with crying, um, and this one is probably seen in uh, 18 or 20 percent of patients. Now, sometimes they're a little bit unusual. This was a, a patient who had presented uh, for sinus surgery because of uh, kind of sinus congestion, and uh, luckily we noticed that there's no, there was no uh, no bony cleft here, and so this actually was brain that had herniated inferiorly. Uh, through the cribriform plate. Uh, and most of the time, the brain that herniates out of the cephalocele is gliotic and, uh, and non-functional. <coughs> this one's a little bit unusual. Uh, also, in that you can see the defect uh, is actually in the cella floor, coming all the way down into the cella. And this is a, a, sphenoid, a sphenoid type of cephalocele. Notice how elongated the stalk is of the infundibulum. Now, Chiari malformations are the, the next kind of general topic um, that I want to consider in this uh, uh, midline defect uh, type of lesion. And uh, these are uh, amazingly common entities. And you see them very routinely in uh, standard imaging, both by CT and MR. Uh, Chiari 1 malformation 
is diagnosed by drawing the line from the uh, back of the clivus, the uh, basion, uh, to the epistheon, the tip of the, the lower tip of the uh, occipital bone. And then if perpendicular, that extends be below five millimeters, is sort of the standard way of calling it PRE1 malformation. Three to five millimeters or three to four millimeters is considered low-lying tonsils. Now, sometimes tonsils do change with age, uh, and so uh, inherently under age 10, sometimes people use six, and then 10 to 30 is five, and above age 30 is four millimeters for that criterion. But it's usually not, uh, it's usually five millimeters is the standard way of, of thinking about this. And the, the tonsils often have this pig-like uh, kind of triangular configuration, and how much of uh, uh, impression on the ventral, uh, uh, more ventral structures, the medulla, uh, is often indicative. You can imagine that when the patient moves their head, typically by looking up, you can often <coughs> exas exacerbate symptoms. Very rarely, these will uh, have hydrocephalus associated with them. Uh, but the, this is really a, a, a cerebellar tonsillar ectopia uh, associated with PR1 malformation seen here in the past specimen. Uh, the, with more entrapment and alteration of CSF dynamics, uh, you will often see uh, syringal myelia. Uh, this is cystic dilatation, um, either of the central canal, which is hydromyelia, or adjacent to the central canal, which is the the syringomyelia, uh, and uh, with symptomatic chiaris, this incidence uh, significantly increases, uh, and with bad, badly symptomatic chiaris, it can be even up to about 80%, but it's probably more, most commonly in asymptomatic individuals, a very isolated and uncommon finding, uh, although it's seen in this case uh, well defined. And you often will see these multiple little areas of septation associated with the serum. Chiari 2 malformation is the one that's associated with the uh, myelomeningocele uh, and, and has a much more uh, ominous type of prognosis. Um, here, this is actually a, a vermian herniation uh, coming down in this particular patient down to the C3 level. Uh, there's about a 50% association with partial agenesis of the corpus callosum. Uh, and the characteristic features include uh, many things. There's like a medullary kink seen here. Uh, there's a uh, tectal beaking. Uh, often the mes mesa intermedia is very prominent. Uh, here with the uh, past specimen, you can see oftentimes the tonsils, I mean the, uh, the vermis is, is very prominently uh, protruding inferiorly. Uh, on axial images, both by CT and MR, you can uh, frequently see these, uh, uh, these really prominent tectal beaking areas and uh, uh, often prominent interdigitation between the medial gyri uh, is also one of the main features. Uh, Chiari 3 malformation is actually a Chiari 2 malformation in association with a uh, cephalocele. And here, this is a fairly extensive uh, cephalocele uh, because it has components both of the, uh, of the ventricles, uh, neural tissue, uh, as well as uh, CSF spaces. Uh, one of the other associations uh, is agenesis of corpus callosum. And this uh, can also be a very isolated finding. The, remember the corpus callosum are all these crossing white matter tracts, and typically they uh, start forming near the genu and then the body and then the splenium and finally the rostrum uh, is formed. Um, and if you don't form the uh, corpus callosum, you, tend, you don't see the cingulate gyrus form, uh, and often it's a very dysmorphic looking posterior aspect of the brain in particular, since most commonly it's the splenium uh, that is involved. Uh, and here on a past specimen, you can see that there's basically no singular gyrus, which is a, a fairly uh, constant finding, uh, except in this entity. Um, if we look at patients that, that have lost the corpus callosum, those white matter fibers that are present in both hemispheres tend to track along the, uh, uh, the ventricles. And often these are called the bundles of probes, 
but you get this sort of characteristic um, kind of pointed configuration of the ventricular system. Uh, and the easiest way to, to look for these uh, areas where you uh, have a genesis of the corpus callosum is to just go up and down in the slices and to see if you have any of these midline structures present. Uh, associated with the corpus callosum, uh, sometimes are, you can get um, areas of calcification. Uh, this is a lipoma of the, uh, of the corpus callosum. Uh, often they're a little bit more bulky and, and tubular nodular along the anterior aspect, but more linear along the posterior aspect. Now disorders of the neural tube, uh, you can also have kind of a destructive change. And typically this is an in utero vascular insult. This is hydranencephaly, uh, and commonly either the internal carotid arteries or the MCAs uh, are occluded for some reason, and the resulting brain parenchyma is never perfused. You uh, do tend to have preservation through the posterior circulation of the uh, basal ganglion structures, but you just never see the brain parenchyma along the side, and this is a very devastating lesion called hydranencephaly. Now what you have to do is to separate that uh, scene here on our left uh, from this entity, which is hydro severe hydrocephalus. Both of these lesions get shunted. The one on the, uh, the hydro hydrocephalus on our right, uh, the patient will get better and uh, may not have any neurological deficit. But the one on the, uh, the hydranencephaly on the left, uh, that patient will go on to die of some infection about age four or five. Sometimes the vascular insult that we see uh, is not nearly as bad. Um, here, basically, you see this large defect and cleft uh, associated with an MCA territory on the right side, uh, and this is porencephaly. Porencephaly is the communication between the ventricular system to the extraaxial CSF space, uh, but it's it's due to this uh, glial destructive change that you see along the side. And we'll talk about that in separation from uh, schism cephaly. Uh, now, sometimes you get these vascular insult, insults. Uh, here, notice that there's really a disparity between the right and the left hemisphere with a lot of volume loss here on the left side. Notice that the uh, uh, mastoid air cells are also much more prominent. And this is an entity called dyke david Son syndrome, where basically it's a vascular insult, but you get kind of resulting hypertrophy of the frontal sinus and the mastoid air cell. Well, let's switch gears a little bit and talk about disorders of neuronal migration and sulcation. Uh, there's a spectrum of diseases uh, that fulfill this uh, neuronal migration problem. Um, the most severe is lysencephaly. Um, and then basically you go to a little bit less severe form, which are the, the combination of agyria, tachygyria, and polymicrogyria. But these are, in essence, the cortical dysplasias that are uh, non lysencephalic uh, Heterotopia is a little islands of gray matter that are stranded somewhere along the migrational course. And for all of these lesions, from going out from the germinal matrix, in the potopalamic groove, all the gray matter moves peripherally. And so these are all disorders which hamper that in some way. Uh, schizencephaly is an abnormal cleft, and we'll talk a little bit about unilateral megalocephaly. Uh, this is uh, one of the forms of lysencephaly. Uh, notice here on pathology how thick this gray matter actually is, and there's no sulcation uh, present. Uh, these are a very severe neuronal migration problems. Uh, and here's an example. Uh, you can see how thick this gray matter is um, with very little white matter and very little inner digitations. Uh, so this is uh, lysencephaly. Now there's another form that has more of a figure eight configuration. Uh, this is the, the type one type four. Um, and these are all associated with various uh, syndromes, which are in your, uh, in your handouts. But um, there's a little bit more of a rudimentary uh, sylvian fissure, which is uh, present in this kind of form. But again, all of these are one uniform, uh, relatively thick uh, area of cortical gray matter. 
Now, as the disease process gets a little bit less severe, uh, you tend to have these areas that are, that are more focal. And, and here, if you notice uh, in the left frontal lobe, a very thick area of uh, cortex uh, with, without much sulcation, with no sulcation, compared to the contralateral sign. Uh, and these are areas of pachygyria or polymicrogyria, which really are not discernible uh, from each other uh, from an imaging standpoint. All of these lesions tend to present as seizure disorders. Uh, and so you tend to see these kids for, for whatever reason because they had an initial seizure. And this is one of the reasons why we tend to go to MR uh, for these patients, because they can be quite difficult to discern a lot of these areas by just CT alone. Uh, now this is a, a fairly pronounced form of heterotopia. And the thing about heterotopia is that it's actually the same signal intensity as gray matter, but it just hasn't moved out uh, to the side. And, and so this is kind of a bilateral um, uh, manifestation of and all these subependimal areas of gray matter. Uh, and this is a fairly extensive heterotopia. Sometimes they can be quite subtle. And if you notice this, uh, this kind of gray matter <coughs> stripe uh, present in this particular patient, this is the, the band-like form of heterotopia. Uh, it tends to be a little bit more severe uh, and tend to have more severe seizure disorders uh, associated with this band-like heterotopia. Uh, schizencephaly is a, a kind of a, an artificial or abnormal cleft that is developing between the um, extraaxial CSF space and the ventricular system. Uh, these can either be, uh, can either be open or closed lip. Uh, the closed lip ones simply have enough brain tissue for, for things to come together and touch. Uh, here in the right frontal lobe, we can see that this is an open schizencephaly. And uh, in, in the CT image, we can see that it's a closed lip schizencephaly. The thing about schizencephaly is that it's covered with gray matter. And you can see this here on the past specimen as well. Um, and that's different than the areas of core encephaly that we looked at earlier where it was more gliotic tissue due to a destructive change. This is a congenital uh, malformation. Oftentimes, areas of schizencephaly are associated with other entities. Uh, this was an amniotic band syndrome. Uh, you can see this bulging meninga uh, uh, seal uh, with an area of open lip schizencephaly associated with this. Unilateral megaloencephaly is an unusual and somewhat rare entity. Um, it's a diffuse uh, hamartoma of one hemisphere. And so you kind of lose the gray-white differentiation between the uh, gray matter and the white matter. Um, the thing that's kind of unique about it, so you know that it's not like a a diffuse glioletosis, uh, cerebri, or some other tumor, is that notice that the ventricular system is also dilated on the same side. And uh, so that's how you separate those two entities. Well, let's move on to uh, disorders of diverticulation and cleavage. Uh, these are uh, entities which uh, basically the brain uh, forms early and splits into a left and right hemisphere and for whatever reason that does not occur. Uh, these include the primarily holoprosencephaly in the various categories. Um, Septo-optic dysplasia is considered to be kind of a form frust of uh, holoprosencephaly, uh, but it has some distinct features. Um, absence of the septum pellucidum can either be acquired uh, like due to hydrocephalus and that sort of thing, or developmental, it can be seen isolated, in which case it's really not that much of a problem, or it can be um, associated with several of these other uh, major uh, major abnormalities. The holoprosencephaly uh, uniformly have uh, some sort of a craniofacial uh, abnormality associated with them. And so in this situation where you basically have the, uh, the alobar form, um, you have a monoventricle. Notice that the, um, the thalami here, seen on this past specimen, have not cleaved. Uh, and uh, oftentimes, 
these patients have either a cyclops or unilateral or, or uni nostril or cleft lip and palate type of deformity. Um, what that looks like on our imaging uh, often is this, you know, large uh, kind of monoventricle. But the thing that's unique about it is that there's really no attempt to uh, separate, you know, like into a box and that sort of thing. Um, now, there's a the next kind of least severe type of abnormality is the semi-lobar form. Notice again, we don't have a septum pellucidum. Uh, we're starting to uh, to split a little bit. Here are two different patients with semi-lobar type. Uh, we do have an anterior fox along the uh, one on the left. The one on the right has not quite split yet. Um, as we move a little bit less in the spectrum, um, we uh, basically uh, don't tend, uh, this is the lobar form. Uh, the final area that splits is in the uh, frontal lobe and typically the inferior frontal lobe. Uh, and uh, here, basically uh, does not have that split between the frontal, frontal hemispheres. Um, Septo-optic dysplasia, typically these uh, children present with uh, either blindness or asymmetric uh, significant vision loss. About two-thirds of them will have some sort of a uh, uh, pituitary dysfunction or hypothalamic dysfunction. And the thing that's odd about it is that, number one, there's no uh, septum pellucidum in most of the cases. But they all, always have these kind of inferior pointing uh, horns associated with them. And if you notice that the, uh, the optic nerves uh, seen here are very hypoplastic, uh, in this case asymmetric and much smaller on the right side. Well, let's talk a little bit about uh, cystic disorders of the posterior fossa. Uh, this is the last major type of category. Uh, Danny Walker complex is considered by most people to be kind of a spectrum, uh, going from Danny Walker malformation, uh, which is the more severe form, to Danny Walker variant, which is much less severe. Uh, Megacisterna magna is, is considered by some to be in that spectrum of Danny Walker, but most people consider it to be kind of a, a normal uh, variant uh, rather than really a pathologic entity. Uh, and arachnoid cyst is another one of those cystic uh, type lesions. Uh, Danny Walker malformation is considered to be uh, a disorder of the outward frame of the fourth ventricle. And so consequently, you get hydrocephalus, because it's in essence an obstructive hydrocephalus. Uh, and you get kind of a dilated ventricular system, including the fourth ventricle. Large cystic collection along the, the posterior fossa. Uh, notice the hydrocephalus here, well defined. Uh, and because the cyst in the posterior fossa uh, enlarges, you get this uh, inversion of the torcula um, and uh, uh, transverse sinus region. Um, now here's a, a comparison between the Dandy Walker malformation on the left side, where you get this very enlarged cystic collection with hydrocephalus, and a Dandy Walker variant case on the right side. Um, notice there's still hydrocephalus. Here's a shunt catheter in place. But the amount of Vermian agenesis uh, commonly seen, you know, both superior and inferior vermis with Danny Walker malformation is much less uh, in the variant uh, formation. Uh, now, on the left here is a uh, is a megacisterna magna. Uh, this child, basically, you can see the temporal horn dilatation, so you know that there's obstructive hydrocephalus. Uh, this was an aqueductal stenosis uh, case, uh, but with a megacisterna magna. Uh, probably because the posterior fossa didn't have much CSF flow, which developed through it. Uh, and the reason I wanted to show it is it kind of in, in separating it, a megacisterna magna, from an arachnoid cyst. The arachnoid cysts, uh, as seen here on the right side, uh, tend to be uh, very asymmetric to one side, often causing a little bit more in the way of bone erosion uh, and a little bit more mass effect locally on the cerebellar hemisphere. Uh, finally, in the cystic lesions in the posterior fossa, I'll just throw in this one uh, less common uh, lesion. This is a Chiari 4 malformation, uh, the, the fourth type of Chiari malformation. Basically, it's a hypoplasia syndrome 
And there's quite a few of the different hypoplasia syndromes, um, you know, for the posterior fossa. Um, and so, in addition to, you know, thinking about big CSF collections which cause mass effect, also think about lesions which aren't developed. So, here the cerebellum basically does not develop, and that's uh, part of the spectrum of PR4. Well, let's switch gears and talk about some of the disorders of, of histogenesis and this, these are the pegomatoses. There are hundreds of these different um, syndromes, but the, by far and away the most common ones are listed here. Uh, Neurofibromatosis type 1 and 2, uh, tuberous sclerosis, von Hippel-Lindau, and uh, Sturge-Weber are the, the more common ones. Osterweber von Du uh, is also part of this uh, telangiectasia and ADM type of uh, All of these basically are disorders of formation uh, are of uh, sort of a malformation of structures that are already there. Um, and let's talk first about neurofibromatosis. Uh, type 1 is a disorder of uh, chromosome 17. There is a well-defined uh, diagnostic clinical criteria, all these cafe LA spots, but uh, plexiform neurofibroma are, uh, are common features. Uh, optic neurofibromas are uh, often seen. Um, you can have osseous uh, dysplasias of the sphenoid wing uh, and, and other osseous problems, you know, with uh, bowing of, of the uh, tibia and those sorts of things. Um, two or more criteria, including first and relative, uh, since it does have a hereditary uh, predilection. Uh, the common things that you're looking for uh, are all these multiple neurofibromas. This is a plexiform neurofibroma on the left side. It's commonly associated with multiple lesions at every level associated with the spinal uh, canal. Uh, here's one that would be diagnostic, right? Two features, optic glioma, well-defined in the left orbit, and then osseous uh, the, uh, kind of dysplasia associated with this uh, sphenoid wing. Um, high, high likelihood of association with, um, with basically optic uh, glioma, um, and here involving the chiasm, you can see the enlargement. Oftentimes these don't enhance. Um, and one of the other features are these, uh, uh, these areas that are commonly seen in the globus pallidus, uh, these areas of hammertominous change, or spongiform change, as some people uh, prefer to call them, um, commonly seen uh, associated with the, uh, the upper cerebellum or more commonly in the globus pallidus region. They can have gliomas associated with them. Uh, here's a patient with a pap specimen of a glioma. Um, here, uh, oftentimes, they will also, this is an pendomoma uh, of the spinal canal associated with uh, NF1. Neurofibromatosis type 2 uh, is, uh, is diagnostic in the case of bilateral acoustic neuromas, but you can also be diagnostic uh, for this entity if you have a first degree relative and then um, with a unilateral eighth nerve neuroma or multiple neurofibromas or meningiomas, gliomas, those sorts of things. So here's an example. Uh, here's a seventh nerve neuroma, a fifth nerve neuroma, a B3 neuroma, and two meningiomas, well-defined NF2 associated with chromosome 22. Uh, uh, tuberous sclerosis, uh, you get this adenomatous sedation uh, associated with seizures, uh, mental retardation. Uh, here are these subtenable tubers, calcified lesions, low-density areas, which are right on T2, um, subcortical uh, cortical tubers, seen here on MR. Uh, this is the one to watch, the one right at the uh, foramen magnum, because this is the one that grows into that giant cell astrocytoma of the uh, tuberous sclerosis. Uh, Serge Weber is, uh, is another entity. Um, you tend to get, it's a disorder of venous drainage, so you get very dilated uh, venous, uh, venous plexuses. Um, here, uh, over top, and sort of a leptomeningeal enhancement up over top uh, of the uh, ventricle and choroid plexus range. This can give you that characteristic tram track uh, calcification seen on some films. Um, and uh, here's a case of Osterweber-Rondu. Um, 
multiple lesions in the posterior fossa, dense enhancement, uh, multiple lesions, and I think Linda showed you uh, a couple cases a little earlier associated with that. You can see the retinal blastoma, which is the same pathologic entity, but it's very dense uh, uh, early enhancement associated with, uh, with the angiograms in these patients. Uh, thank you very much for your attention. It's been my pleasure to talk with you. And yeah. we'll move on to the next week. Thank you. Thank you. some 
surrounding edema. Let's talk about indirect injury. Uh, again, this is really a, a white matter injury for the most part, again, due to uh, acceleration or deceleration of either linear or rotational forces. Clinically, patients have an initial neurologic impairment, uh, often a poor prognosis. This is associated with high-speed motor vehicle uh, collisions uh, often. Uh, there's a triad uh, of uh, manifestations radiologically. We see injuries at the gray-white junction, uh, typically, which would either be superficial or deep. The corpus callosum and the dorsolateral midbrain and pond. So remember that triad. Show you some examples. Uh, here we see multiple hemorrhagic contusions at the gray-white junction, uh, both superficial on the left uh, as well as deep here uh, on the right. Uh, here's another area of the triad, the dorsolateral midbrain. We see a focal uh, acute hemorrhage uh, involved in that area on CT as well as on MR. Let's talk about uh, hemorrhage. And we'll talk about all the, dif the different locations that we can see in the trauma patient, subarachnoid, subdural, epidural, intracerebral, or intraparenchymal, as well as intraventricular hemorrhage. Subarachnoid hemorrhage, Trauma is the most common cause by incidence alone. Uh, as far as uh, non-traumatic subarachnoid hemorrhage, aneurysm accounts for most of those uh, cases with arterial venous malformations uh, accounting for even fewer. Subdural hematomas. Uh, these occur between the potential space, between, uh, between the dura and the arachnoid. These are venous injuries uh, due to injuries uh, to the bridging veins in the subdural space. And they're usually associated with a large underlying parenchymal injury. That's why these patients have poor uh, Glasgow coma scale scores often. It's not due to the small mass effect from the subdural, but it's the underlying parenchymal injury. How do these appear uh, on imaging? Well, they're crescent shaped. Uh, they do cross the sutures. Uh, but they're limited by the dural sinuses, and we'll contrast this with epidural hematomas. Subdural so hematomas can also involve a false or the tentorium. Here are just two examples of subdural hematomas. Again, a crescent uh, in shape. These are acute, so right on CT. Again, very little subdural hematoma can cause a great deal of mass effect, usually due to the associated underlying parenchymal injury. Here's a, a subdural hematoma. Again, subdural hematomas respect the dural reflection, so this does not cross the midline, rather it enters into the inner hemisphere fissure, both anteriorly as well as posteriorly. These are examples of isodense or subacute subdural hematomas. Really, the only radiologic manifestation here is a sort of featureless appearance laterally as well as inward buckling of the gray-white junction on the right compared to that on the left. We can also have bilateral isodense subdural hematomas, which can be a little bit more difficult to detect. Again, look for that featureless periphery and the inward buckling of the gray-white junction. Chronic subdural hematomas are hypodense on CT, as we can see uh, an example here. They can often be isodense with CSF in the chronic setting. <laughs> we can also uh, see in-growth of granulations, synecchio or adhesions within chronic subdural hematomas. Uh, this is a, an unenhanced CT on the left and an enhanced CT on the right. Uh, we can see enhancement of a rind up to around the subdural hematoma, as well as enhancements of this uh, internal uh, synecchio or adhesions. These patients are predisposed for acute uh, superimposed upon chronic subdural hematomas. Typical scenario would be uh, a patient, alcoholic patient, for example, who uh, uh, has fallen multiple times, may not remember that history, and then can come in with an acute superimposed upon chronic subdural hematoma. Subdurals can also occur along the tentorium uh, here. Uh, this can often be mistaken for a uh, blood pool in the transverse sinus. If there's ever any doubt, uh, MR with its multiplanar capabilities uh, can easily solve that issue. Uh, here, again, on MR, uh, we see a subdural 
uh, respecting the dual reflection, uh, again, entering the uh, inner hemispheric fissure posteriorly on T1 as well as T2 wave image, images. Again, notice the large underlying parenchymal injury, which we can see here on MR, that we may not necessarily see on CT, except for a large degree of midline shift. How about epidural hematomas? Well, these are confined to the uh, potential space uh, between the inner table of the skull and the dura. These are arterial injuries as opposed to the subdural, which are mainly which are venous injuries. A small percentage of epidural hematomas can be venous, usually involving a major dural uh, venous sinus, uh, more commonly seen in children. How do these look on imaging? Well, they're biconvex and lenticular. They're limited by the sutural margins, and they may cross the venous sinuses. So again, in contrast to the subdural hematomas. Examples of epidural hematomas by convex or lenticular uh, in shape here, again, respecting the coronal suture. Uh, in this case, uh, again, another epidural hematoma, non-displaced fracture of the squamosal portion of the temporal bone, uh, again, respecting the landoid suture posteriorly and the coronal suture anteriorly. Again, another example of an epidural hematoma by convex or lenticular in shape, non-displaced fracture of the squamosal portion of the temporal bone with injury to the middle meningeal artery. This was an example of an iatrogenic uh, epidural hematoma due to uh, shunt placement in a pediatric patient. This is an example of an epidural hematoma in that 10%, that's a venous injury. This is along the uh, transverse sinus here posteriorly. Uh, another example of an epidural hematoma due to uh, uh, laceration in the transverse sinus, again, venous injury here. Is an example of one due to a laceration in the sphenoparietal sinus, which runs along the greater wing of the sphenoid bone. Again, you see this uh, epidural hematoma associated with the venous injury. How about parenchymal hematomas? Well, there's a differential uh, to that in addition to trauma, which we always have to keep in mind. Uh, that's going to be hypertension. And hypertension uh, can be uh, suspected on the basis of history as well as on the basis of location in the patient. Vascular malformation, uh, aneurysm. If aneurysms leak, they can often adhere to the parenchyma and they can literally blow right into the parenchyma and give uh, an intraparenchymal hematoma with very little subarachnoid component. Hemorrhagic tumors, uh, bleeding diathesis. Uh, hemorrhagic infarct or amyloid angiopathy. Again, the latter is really a diagnosis of exclusion, usually seen in older patients with low bar uh, hemorrhages. This is an example uh, here of uh, trauma, again, uh, involving the inferior frontal and temporal lobes, typical uh, locations for trauma. Here's an example of hypertensive hemorrhage involving um, basal ganglia. Uh, and this left slide involving the cerebellum in the, the dentate nucleus region on the right. This is a patient with an appendiloma, a noca calcification, uh, which subsequently hemorrhaged into the posterior fossa. Here's a patient with a giant aneurysm uh, involving the middle cerebral artery. And note the rim like calcification in this giant aneurysm with a large uh, intraparenchymal uh, component uh, of the hemorrhage in the temporal lobe. There's also a large degree of subarachnoid as well as intraventricular blood. Here's an example of a cavernoma with a fluid fluid level uh, in the, uh, the midbrain, uh, causing an intraparenchymal hematoma. Briefly talk about the MR appearance of, of hemorrhage. Because as hemorrhage evolves, uh, its magnetic properties change, we can stage hemorrhage fairly accurately on MR uh, into a uh, hyperacute acute early and late subacute as well as chronic uh, hemorrhage. And uh, that is because uh, as uh, hemoglobin ages, its chemical properties and therefore magnetic properties change. Oxyhemoglobin uh, is going to be iso. It really looks like everything else, like uh, brain tumors, infection, etc. That is iso or low on T1, hyper intense on T2. The oxyhemoglobin is going to be ISO on T1, uh, hyperintense on T2. Early or intracellular methemoglobin is bright and dark 
whereas extracellular late uh, subacute net hemoglobin is bright and bright. Finally, uh, chronic uh, blood or hemosiderin is going to be ISO on T1 and dark on T2 weighted images. Just some examples. Uh, this is hyperacute hemorrhage on CT. We see it's ISO to hypotense on T1 and uh, hyper in intense uh, on T2. This is uh, deoxyhemoglobin or acute hemorrhage, ISO on T1, hypo intense on T2. It's an example of uh, net hemoglobin in the both uh, stages. We see it's bright on um, a T1 and dark on T2, early subacute net hemoglobin, uh, that is intracellular, and then bright and bright, that is late uh, subacute or extracellular net hemoglobin. And then there's a hemosiderin rim, which is iso to hypo on T1 or hypo on T2, and here we see surrounding edema. Herniation syndromes, uh, we have uh, subpulsing herniation, tonsillar, ascending uh, and descending transitorial herniation, as well as external uh, herniation. Tonsillar herniation is usually due to a posterior false of mass or hemorrhage. This results in downward displacement of the cerebellar tonsils, as we can see here, can result in a pica infarct. Descending transitorial herniation uh, can result uh, when the uncus or hippocampus is displaced medially over the tentorial incisura, as we see it here on the right side. You can also have a central uh, descending transitorial herniation of just uh, the brain stem, and you can get direct hemorrhages uh, in the brain uh, due to tearing of the pontine perforators. Uh, again, another example of descending transitorial herniation. Uh, you can have Kernaghan's notch, which is actually the ipsilateral hemiparesis. So, side of the injury is on the right side, patient presents with a right hemiparesis. That's due to a contusion in the contralateral midbrain on the contralateral tentorial hiatus. Kernaghan's notch. Uh, descending transitorial herniation can also result in a posterior cerebral artery infarction, as well as uh, cranial nerve 3 and 4. Uh, injuries, just uh, some more examples. Again, effacement of the uh, ambient cistern on the right side, and also the supercellar cistern. And uh, we can sometimes, uh, uh, rather this is on the left side, is where the radiation is, we can see dilatation of the ipsilateral CP angle cistern here. Ascending transitorial herniation can also occur, uh, usually again due to posterior fossa mass. We see the vermis protruding through the tentorial incisura. We can have a superior cerebellar artery part uh, or an aqueductal uh, compression resulting from this. Let's talk about vascular injury uh, briefly. Uh, extracranial injury uh, usually uh, is in the form of dissection. And that can uh, look like a stenosis. We can have frank occlusion of the vessel, pseudoaneurysm with distal embolization. The carotid artery dissections usually occur at the level of the skull base where the more mobile or the internal carotid connects with the more fixed uh, portion of the, of the uh, carotid canal. Vertebral uh, dissections usually occur at the C1, C2 levels. Some examples here, the section of the intern on angiography, common carotid ejection. And we can see this on MR as an intramural hematoma. So uh, we can uh, use MR, make this diagnosis angiography for the most part. Uh, you can get a good exam, a good MR exam is not necessary. Example of an occlusion uh, of a vertebral artery. Uh, here's a pseudoaneurysm involving the carotid artery, again at the skull base at the junction of the more mobile uh, intracranial uh, uh, cervical carotid with the um, uh, petrous uh, carotid artery. Intracranial uh, injury can also result in dissection, uh, CC fistula, pseudoaneurysm, or laceration of the middle meningeal artery. Here's a fracture through the skull base with dissection of the supraclinoid portion of the internal carotid artery. Here's an example of a CC fistula. This is uh, an internal carotid artery injection. Notice here uh, that there's opacification of the cavernous 
sinus on the right side as well as on the left side through intracavernous uh, collateral vessels. And post-embolization, again, no longer see uh, the cavernous sinus, and we see the normal uh, appearance of the MCA and ACA. Here's a pseudoaneurysm involving tip basilar artery, which was uh, successfully embolized. Skull fractures uh, can be linear depressed, or one can have sutural diastasis, the linear skull fracture, uh, which is seen on plain film. Again, always look at your scout on CT, because you can often miss fractures that are parallel to the imaging plane. Is a depressed skull fracture. This is depressed more than the thickness of the skull that uh, will require surgical elevation. Here's an example of sutural diastasis involving the lambdoid suture on the right side. I'll close by uh, mentioning just some complications of skull fracture, including a dural hematoma, cortical contuberation, dissection, we talked about infection, cyacephaly, pneumocephaly, <coughs> leptomeningeal cyst, or cranial nerve injury. An example of a fracture on CT where we see a cortical laceration or contusion on MR. Here's an example of a patient with a fracture to the posterior wall of tunnel sinus with a subsequent development of the subdural empyema uh, on enhanced uh, CT. So uh, here's a, a patient with a fracture through the optic strut resulting in cranial nerve injury uh, to cranial nerve uh, uh, two with subsequent blindness. So in summary, uh, I've discussed um, the strategies of imaging, mechanisms of intracranial injury, hemorrhage herniation syndromes, vascular injury, fractures, and uh, complications of intracranial injury. And, uh, I hope uh, that you gained a little bit from the future of you. Thanks for your attention. Dan Barboriak from Cerebral Vascular Disease, and then wind up with the Neuro Case Conference, and then you guys are good to go. Restricted and diffusion weighted images are bright, 
that means that you have probably an acute stroke, usually because water has shifted from extracellular space, where the protons are around rather freely, into the intracellular space, and become, the water's almost, protons almost become as if it puts a make can't move, and so that gives you bright signal diffusion. Diffusion weighted images you need to remember are weighted by diffusion, of course, but they're also two weighted generally. And so if, you, if there are areas of controversy, you want to look at ABC maps or parent diffusion coefficient maps, that's the home. Why is diffusion such a great thing? Why are we so excited about diffusion? Well, this is a good example. 20 year old woman, left side weakness, and you look at the T2 weighted images, which should be positive, but rather early, it's really hard to see a difference. You'd say, well, yeah, a little brighter here, but easy to walk by. Diffusion weighted images, impossible to walk by. Lighting up like a light bulb and telling you that this is cytotoxic edema, water is present within cells, probably acute stroke, and the time of light MRA confirms loss of the internal crowded artery and MC on that side. But the other cool thing about diffusion is that it doesn't stay positive forever. And that means you can actually time a stroke. So, for example, here in February of 98, we had a woman who had aphasia, and she has all the signs of a recent infarction, right on diffusion, even a little bit right on T2, so not hyperacute, but acute, probably subacute at this point. And then what you see later is that you have the normal evolution of strokes. So you have a very simple the ventricles get a little bit bigger, but the diffusion weighted image is high. So this allows you to age this stroke as being a recent event, this is a chronic event. And that comes in really handy. Here is a woman who's 73 years old, and her flare images, and she has some right sided weakness and some artery, and her flare images has a whole bunch of little bright spots. Your differential here is perhaps it's a complicated migraine, not a stroke at all. Perhaps it's a big stroke and we don't see it on her flare, or maybe it's a small stroke. All those three different possibilities have three different treatments. And the diffusion weighted images gives you the answer. It's this particular one, this slack human, the post of the internal capsule, that's causing the uh, symptoms. So you know it's a small stroke, not a big stroke, and also not a complicated migraine. What about perfusion weighted imaging the stroke? Well, diffusion weighted imaging is, is generally believed to, to detect and outline the ischemic core being part. So, in other words, as a rule, this is 100% true, as a rule, if something's right on diffusion, that tissue is not going to come back. It is dead tissue. But how can you define the tissue that's not dead, but simply not functioning because it's relatively high bulk perfused? And we can use perfusion weighted MR imaging or CT perfusion to define what we call the ischemic penumbra, the area of tissue surrounding the core of infarct, which, has a, a, a head, which is at risk of going on to infarction later, but is not yet infarcted. Here's an example of a small stroke of the right occipital lobe. Now take a look, if you will, at what a perfusion MR imaging looks, looks like. As you put gadolinium in, you actually get dark signal on a perfusion weight sequence. And what I want you to this loop is that if you look in the back, it seems like the dark signal is coming to this bank and compared to this bank. Dark here and then dark here, so there's a lag of one side to the other. If you put a region of interest on those locations, you'll see that on the right side there is a lag in the decrease in signal intensity over time. And you can make a time to peak, peak map, which shows you that the area of relative hypoperfusion is actually much larger than that little infarction that you saw on the T2 weighted images. So this may be defined for us an area that could go on to infarction that we are going to want to treat, perhaps even after the three hour limit after uh, symptoms began. And we can use CT perfusion in a similar way. There's a, 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 a CT perfusion on a cine. You can see this area that's hypo intense. And put regions of interest down, you'll see that on the left side, you have a lag and this up flow of, uh, of uh, of attenuation and also a decreased peak of attenuation, showing you that this is an area where there is relative hypoperfusion. You can make a map, but this happens to be a, a mean transit time map showing that the mean transit times in these areas are actually increased. Again, defining an area that may benefit from intervention. So that's the new paradigm of stroke. Let's talk about the old paradigm of things that everybody knows, but we'll, we'll blast through this really quickly. What does stroke look like? Well, there are three basic morphologies, and then there are the variations. The three basic morphologies are a large vessel infarct that's wedge shaped, provides a causal cortex, white matter, calls a vascular territory, blah, blah, blah. And this is some theories left MCA territory, and here is the ACA territory, very simple. And here is bilateral posterior cerebral artery territory. 
So it falls in that third territory. This is nothing to do false. And you can have subsections. This is a little embolic infarction in the opercular, uh, following the operculum and insula on the left. And you can see there's a little bit of hemorrhage, which is not an atypical primary embolic infarction. The second morphology is lacunar disease, which is basically a manifestation of small disease. Usually hypertension and diabetes cause pathologic changes in vessel walls called lipohyalinosis. And the result is small, usually less than a centimeter, round infarctions at the end of these vascular territories. These infarctions have very typical locations, as you know, in the pons, thalami, these are being in internal capsules, and they cavity over time. And this single slide tells you everything you know about lacunes. CT, you should see this lacune over the left retainment, and that's what it looks like on T1. And there is on proton density T2. Chronic acute. Ah, but on the right, post-germinal internal capsule, we also lacune. So the subacute lacune over time will evolve and will look, look like the chronic lacune that you see on the left. The other basic morphology is called pupillariosis, UPOs, the microvascular disease, with UPOs, of course, are other objects. These occur typically in the central semi-valley, called radiata, and the deep ventricular white map, areas that are most more vulnerable to ischemia than other areas. And pathologically, this represents a mishmash of microvascular disease, gliosis, and demyelination. And the theory is that you have lipohyalinosis and superimposed muscle tension. And here's a typical example. Here we are in the central semi-valley, radiata, patchy, microvascular disease, quite severe in this case. Then we have all the in-between uh, findings. These are bilateral watershed infarctions between ACA and MCA and MCA and PCA territories. And this is the deep shed infarction that you should know about. This is a partic has a particular location, usually at the level of the lateral ventricles, and it has this linear appearance uh, that goes along this parallel to the lateral ventricles. People call this the string of beads appearance because it's, it's sometimes is uh, little heterogeneous. This tends to be associated with the areas of stenosis somewhere in the either cervical wells or neck. Here is one in the right MCA. Here's an example of global ischemia, which is a patient with hypoxia after, uh, after cardiac surgery. You see bilateral basal ganglia abnormalities, occipital lobe abnormalities. There is a hypoxic event, and, and the areas that are most vulnerable in this case are the areas that have the highest utilization of oxygen, which include the basal ganglia, the Purkinje cells, and the serotonin, and of course, the temporal lobe, the, uh, the CA2 here, the region in particular. And one particular stroke I want you always to remember is the posterior fossa stroke. This is a large stroke of the right, uh, of the right pica territory. And you'll notice that it's caused hydrocephalus one day after the event. The importance of recognizing this kind of stroke is it's the one kind of stroke that surgery actually has much a role in because you can simply take that part of the cerebellum out, relieve the hydrocephalus, and the patient will do much better. All right, let's skip forward to where we talk about the etiology of the stroke, which is actually towards the beginning of your handout for those who are interested. The majority of strokes, of course, are caused by atherosclerotic disease, which can happen in any of the vessels, particularly the common product by applications. Other sorts uh, so, uh, sorts of strokes come from emboli, from cardiogenic causes, atrial fibrillation, thrombus after myocardial infarction, endocarditis, etc. The important thing to remember, though, are the unusual causes, such as dissection. As Dr. Petrello mentioned, this is blood penetrating in intimal defect and accounts for a good percentage of infarcts in young adults. Uh, in the internal carotid, these happen at the origin of the vessel or near the skull base. Uh, and, and they present with unilateral head pain, ischemia, neck pain, corner syndrome. There's the uh, angiogram, yet another example showing you the slender tapering that is typical of a dissection. But dissection can be uh, diagnosed rather specifically on MRI. You tend to have bright signal surrounding the flow void due to the, sub, uh, the subacute hematoma surrounding the vessel. And what you may have on MRA sequences, because the MRA sequences, particularly the 3D type of blood, 3D type of blood, recently, you'll see this T1 bright clot here in the back and flow, so you'll get this kind of yin yang two piece of uh, clot and, uh, and flow on the MRA. So you want to look at your source images because this can be hard to see on your uh, projections. Fiber muscular dyslagia is seen about half a percent of angiograms. We don't know why it happens, but it has a very typical appearance of a string of beads where you have is a narrowing and widening in a row. And this tends to have a benign course, but can lead to involved disease. 
It's important to rec recognize our aridities. There's a particular look you're looking for on, ge on geography where you have segmental narrowing and, and sometimes dilatation. Uh, the causes include tuberculosis, homopolis, and polenze, where you can get vasomeningitis and involvement of skull based vessels. But, but we frequently see things like lupus, that way is rare, polyarthritis, nodosum. Uh, primary arteritis and CNS is kind of the idiopathic uh, uh, arteritis, garbage basket, which we don't really know. And then large vessels you can see as well, giant cell arteritis, takiasus, and brothers of radiation can also cause it. Here's an example of takiasu arteritis, uh, appropriately called pulseless disease. You see that you have only one single vessel coming up, and the origins of your arch vessels have been completely cut off. Takiasu arteritis. And here's an example of primary, uh, pri uh, primary arteritis of the arteritis of the CNS or PACNS. Uh, here's an area of narrowing in the P1 segment. Notice this kind of irregular narrowing peripheral in the P2 segments. Usually atherosclerosis is going to be more uh, vocal and it's going to involve proximal vessels. So this is a good picture for vasculitis. Here's a picture of vasculitis. You can see this vascular irregularity where vessels can become smaller and bigger. That's not what they should do. The other area is the stenosis. This turns out to be a cocaine vasculitis. There are other vascular problems that you can see in an MRI. And here are very little areas of flow blood or line the basal ganglia and the internal capsules with an area of tissue loss, which is kind of subtle here in the right frontal lobe. And this is the moya moya pattern of disease, which can come from primary moya moya disease, but also can come from sickle cell. This looks like, a, in geography, this tangle of vessels, which has been like into a puppet's home, and hence the term moya moya, which is from the Japanese language. Uh, I want to talk a little bit, for just a second, of something that might look like a stroke and maybe you want to know about, which is posterior reversible encephalopathy syndrome of press. This manifests as bilateral, usually symmetric, subcortical white matter abnormalities, usually most prominent posterior, occipital lobe, cerebellum, etc. This is a disorder of cerebral autoregulation that presents with headaches, visual disturbances, and seizures. And the differential diagnosis here is hypertensive encephalopathy, preeclampsia, and immunosuppressive drugs such as cyclospelin are the most common causes. Just to show you what that looks like. Uh, since this is cerebral vascular disease, it's not in your syllabus. I'm sorry about that. Bilateral cerebellum. Here's the bilateral uh, occipital lobes going to the temporal to the, to the temporal lobes, and it's bilateral and symmetric. You might say, well, that looks a lot like stroke. The diffusion-related images are very helpful in this regard because they show no hypotensity, even when the patient is acutely sick, but they do show abnormalities in the non-diffusion-related images, which we call B0 images. So in other words, there is no restriction of diffusion to suggest stroke, and this is a typical appearance of press in this patient who has bone marrow transplant that's taking some time. All right, venous thrombosis. Venous thrombosis you want to keep your eye out for because it does tend to be underdiagnosed. The typical appearance is subcortical infarcts, which are frequently hemorrhagic. The causes are, are very big dehydration, hypocoagal state, infection, tumor pregnancy. And the key points you're looking for are non-vascular distributions, again, frequently hemorrhagic and bilateral involvement, looking at the vessels themselves, perhaps to see the delta sign, which we demonstrate here. You have on the non-contrast CT, you have a focal area of hyperintensity in the superior sagittal sinus posteriorly. And you get the, the delta sign after contrast where you see okay, areas of venous uh, filling around this area of clot in the superior sagittal sinus. So this is an example of uh, venous sinus thrombosis. And here's a, what this looks like on team weighted MR sequences. You see subacute hemorrhage clot in, the, in vessels. Galen and straight sinus and here's on angiography you get no filling at the at the top. Again, these, all these are complementary for diagnosing uh, uh, venous infarction, and we usually use MR nowadays. One thing venous infarction will do, you will lose a, a flow boy on MR, and here's the superior sagittal sinus, and the flow boy is gone, and then you get the associated hemorrhage, T1 hypertensive subacute hemoglobin, intracellular blood products here in a non-vascular distribution. And that should be the tip-off to look at your venous sinuses for venous infarction. OK. Instead of talking to you about always a stroke, what I'm actually going to do now is show you a whole bunch of strokes right now. 
We call this the pocket. When you see a case, whether it's clinically or you're someplace where somebody's asking questions about cases, not don't bother to happen. But if, that, if you find yourself in that situation you don't see a lot, one thing I want you to consider is the function because the findings can be very subtle. And what I want to try to do with this bunch of cases is try to train your eye to look at the cortex in your scan pads. These things can be very subtle. So for example, in this case, does anybody see a stroke? I guess the answer to that is no. So to take a look, it's again, very subtle. But if you, if you look out here, the gray-white differentiation is less good. See how you see bright areas here? And you just don't see that same kind of thing over here. There's this edge right here. Of course, it's much easier here, but you want to identify it back here if you can. How about this case? Do I have normal? Raise your hand, normal. No? Nobody's going for it. <laughs> People are getting smarter over here. Well, the infarcts here are bilateral posterior cerebral artery. There's a little wedges bilaterally. You can see these are, these are, sorry, these are actually their watershed functions. How about this case? Again, you could train your eye to look at the gray matter lane and trace it all the way around. Look for gaps in the gray matter. All right, anybody stay on the left side? Right? Somebody's saying right? Okay. And there it is. Here is that gap, bright signal cortex. It wraps around all the way around here, and you see this gap, and 17 days later, it's very obvious. What about the case? Well, here you've got very dense cerebellum, and actually, it looks like the, this is not contrast with the study, but you still have very bright, bright, uh, bright vessels. And what this is, is a diffuse infarction. And what you will get in kids, particularly, is after about a week or so, you can get actually calcification of that. Infarct and almost pseudo normalization. This is actually a little heterogeneous and is actually calcification of this diffuse and catastrophic infarction. Where is your gray and white differentiation? Where are your basal ganglia? Definitely at all here. Okay, how about this case? Left side? Right side. Right side? We're talking about right here. Again, notice this edge right here. This is, this is the, unfortunately, this is the subtleties of looking for stroke. And this is what you get on day zero. Diffusion is right. It's not so bright. You see MCA, MLS to the MCA red branches. This is what it looks like one day later. Very nicely defined. Any abnormality here? look for, including your search pattern, is flow points. So if you see a basilar here and a carotid here, you should always see another one here. And that's missing. That's not good. And this enhancement, this post contrast image is actually abnormal. This is slow flow within arterial vessels. So this, these two MR sequences are the moral equivalent, or these two images are the moral equivalent to this picture on the same page, occluded right internal, sorry, left internal carotid artery. Reconstitution of the of the uh, supraclinoid ICA and the MCA branches through collaterals through orbit. So this is the ophthalmic, and here's the supraclinoid ICA. You have slow reconstitution, but occlusion here. And that's what people see. Just to give you a feeling for what kind of things you can come up against in clinical practice. And of course, we want to look for the other signs of infarct. Particularly early on day zero, always look for your hyperdense vessel that you see here in the left MCA. Two days later, we have the corresponding infarction. And sometimes a dense vessel will be the only sign we'll see. Uh, hemorrhage is something you see more in when once the, and for example, lysis, you'll see hemorrhagic in part. Here it is in the left PCA territory, bright stuff, bright stuff, which is subacute methemical. <laughs> Chronic infarctions, easy to tell. You, you will see secondary dilatation of the lateral ventricle is lateral to this. And you can see this particular finding, posterior and internal capstan going down the ponds, which is called Wolverian generation, which is a sign of chronic infarction. We'll skip ahead to the part where we talk about evaluation of literature. We have lots of alternatives to the time of flight MRA, digital subtraction in geography. But we have three time of flight. 2D tunnel flight, gadolinium enhanced, and they show more or less the same thing. Gadolinium enhanced 3D tunnel flight probably gives you a little more accurate idea, and of course we have CT 
as well for the carotid bifurcation. And you can use MR to look at the veins. Demography and CQB are both helpful techniques here. You see the vein game. And I paint the two techniques. Now, there's a whole section of your handout about the characteristics of hemorrhage that Dr. Petrella covered very well. So let's advance to the hemorrhagic strokes from hypertension if you're following page 421. If you're not, just follow along. Hypertension hemorrhage uh, is something you want to worry about in any clinical symptom of stroke. These are not traumatic if you're talking about 10% of strokes and a vast majority of these are divided. These have very typical locations, again, that you want to be aware of. Uh, cerebellum, basal vein, Else. The theory of aneurysm, of microaneurysm formation by Charcot and Bouchard gives you some idea of why this may happen. The idea is that little microaneurysms form on perforating vessels in these particular locations, and, and hypertension chronically will cause those to burst. And you get this typical pattern. Here you have some more acute and subacute hemorrhage in the left uh, basal ganglia. It's dark on T2. Surrounding intensity, and you have this big typical appearance for a hypertensive hemorrhage. And these will end up becoming little slits of tissue loss and gliosis in the long term. Another uh, cause of hemorrhagic infarction is amyloid angiopathy, which comes from deposition of amyloid in the median and artificial small and medium sized vessels of the corpus and left meninges. The typical pattern here are lower hemorrhages in the supraventorial space. In affecting patients that are usually over 60 and generally even over 65, if you take if you use the term healthy pyroflingens, if anyone was asking questions about this entity, they will be very happy that you know what you know what you to know about and geography. New subject. What do you do with this kind of case? I was actually asked, well, what are the feeding vessels for this meningioma here? You have T1 hyper T1 hypertense or isotense tense mass. Enhanced with gadolinium and on T2, it's very bright. And what's the approach you want to use to biopsy this? And when people ask about these ideas, you want to think about it because if you sort of say, you know, I'll go ahead and biopsy that, let me show you this picture, aneurysm, you know, that's not it. So this is what the aneurysm was slow poking. They actually look like a soft tissue mass. That's something to keep in mind. If you look carefully, though, these, there will be flow voids in general debasing in this direction. So I think it's kind of, kind of hard to see sorites in this direction here. T1, which is showing you that this slow flow of the structure. The aneurysms have very typical locations in the intercommunicating territory, ACA, ICA, which is of course pre-com, right, and actuality, and MCA for people with asthma. About 20% are multiple, so you want to make sure you've done a geogram to exclude second locations. Typical uh, uh, presentation, of course, is the worst headache of a, of a patient's life. The giant aneurysms are very 25 millimeters or larger. And the mycotic aneurysms can be in the typical locations and result in septic MY. Typical poster can get an aneurysm of the left common carotid artery, or left internal carotid artery, excuse me. This is the anterior communicating artery aneurysm seen here with the surround of human hyperintense hemorrhage and blood in the cistern of the anterior cerebral artery and also above the cingulum. And there it is on the geography, A1 set anterior communicating artery. We can use MRA to look at aneurysms. This happens to be a bad tip top of the aneurysm, but you can see with MRA, it's not the nicest picture in the world. And so if you want to get a little better look at it, TTA gives you a little better look. Your CTA, top of the vascular aneurysm, looking from the back. And, sorry, if you notice carefully, the nice thing about the CTA is it shows a second aneurysm uh, opposite of uh, the spike of branch where you see the aneurysm there on the left, as well as the top of the vascular Let's talk about some basic vascular diseases that you know about. The hemorrhage of Asia's are usually small, solitary lesions. They have a very typical location, which is right in the center of the body. They can be in other places, but then it's tough to tell them tumors. Uh, they are comprised of dilated capillaries with intervening or are frequently incidental things. And suggest to find this lace-like enhancement with very little active images. So here's a typical capillary tonnage of Asia. If you think so, we have the path group, obviously. Pre-contrast, post-contrast system. Very small amount of enhancement. No abnormality on the T2, and there's that enhancement again on the chrome. It's a cool look for capillary telangiectasia. Cameron's angiomas account for about 50 malformations and frequently present with bleeding or seizures. And these are comprised of multiple sinusoidal vascular channels without interposed long brain. They have a great or mulberry-like appearance on pathology. 
And the difficult appearance is some central heterogeneity, which tends to be hyper-intense, surrounded by a ring of T2-rated images of dark signal and a complete incident ring, typically. You will not see any feeding arteries or draining veins at the end of St. Geoma. You're just susceptible to showing that there is either ferritin or incident in this region. Here's an exophytic camera St. John. You might think this is a tumor. Pre-contrast coming out of the left side of the mid-brain, that cerebral peduncle. Post-contrast, but on the T2-weighted images, you get that very typical appearance. Hemorrhage, complete hemocidrin ring, heterogeneous in the center, more heterogeneous on post-contrast. This tips you off that this is a camera St. John. Venus angiomas are usually incidental malformations of venous drainage that tend to be silent. They can be associated with the cavernous angiomas that we just showed you, and so you can't have bleeding associated with them. That usually means that there's a cavernous angioma in your body. And they have a very typical appearance, which is illustrated here, which is kind of like a uh, palm tree that might be upside down or on the side. A Medusa's head configuration is another term that's used. That's a hemorrhage. This is a little old bonus registration artifact in this venous channel. So you have a bunch of small little holes going into a single venous. AV malformations are a serious uh, presenting young patients with seizures, bleeding, and other neurological deficits, and have a rather large risk of bleeding, between 2 and 4 percent. And they are comprised of a torturous tangled vessels with an abnormal uh, arterial supply uh, that's plated, as well as highly venous drainage that you can see here. The nidus is the connection between the arterial and venous components. This can be very small, very see, perhaps contrast against the MRS, the best way to find that which is the channel between the two. Euroarchial venous malformations, Dr. Carroll talked a little bit about, as present elevations usually require trauma, surgery, sinus thrombosis, and all lead to this acquired condition. Cavernous sinus is a very frequent area that we can have other transverse signal sinuses as well, and can present with tinnitus, really a headache, and you can see on the edge of the sinus filling from uh, arterial injection and sinus filling is too early. So here we have an early arterial injection of the, of the internal carotid artery. Again, we have a line too early showing it has to be some kind of uh, venous uh, fistula. And here again, a little bit later, we're just getting out of the venous drainage. Too early. Again, uh, uh, fistula. And this is the AP view this year, and there's the fistula. Carotid cameras fistulas, Dr. Patrell also mentioned, this is a fistula between cameras sinus and the internal carotid artery frequently or external primary branches, presenting usually a trauma with some increased venous pressure and larger abdominal vein as seen here. This presents with proptosis, demonstrated here as well. You can get you will get pain in the eye and proptosis, secondary glaucoma, you can have a retroral early on physical exam. You can see even here this is against the lab. This is something radiograph radiologically we can treat by giving to an occlusion. And here's an example, this is front of the head over here, back of the head. This is the internal carotid. This is the cavernous portion of the carotid, and before you even see uh, MCA branches, you see filling of the cavernous sinus, the intersinus inter uh, uh, connections behind the clivus, and also the severe abdominal pain. Finally, vein or gain mechanisms are in actuality AVMs or, or arterial venous fistulas involving the median vein of the postcephalon, which can present in a couple ways. If they have a mean and aid with with the vein gain landers, and you have a secondary uh, congestive heart failure. If you have a slightly older patient, you frequently present with hydrocephalus, failure to drive, and mental retard retardation. These can be very difficult to treat. Uh, are treated generally with surgery, or now the trend is more towards the vascular embolization. And pull of the vein gain landers, the neural artery injection into the basilar, this is an AP view, and you see lots of little radicals coming off of the top of the basilar and filling this enlargement in the area of the vein transverse sinus, and here is the signal and sinus going to the the vein. This is the This is the younger program here, looking at the carotid artery, the best because as you can see, you'll all pass. Best of luck to you, and good luck. Thank you.